Wagwan, my name's Sean. Um, I use she her pronouns, and this is um, this is Trans Pride Southwest Trans and event. Um, yeah, so we are actually gonna only have like three um interview thingies. Um, unfortunately, um, Chayo like can't make it because of like personal reasons. Um, so we have um, like first we've got like. Alison talking about like her experiences as like an older trans person. Um, then we have Daniel talking about um, like I guess the intersection between like trans and like disability issues. And then we have like Travis talking about like passing. Um, so yeah, um, sorry for like the technical difficulties. It just uh, yeah, technology is a bit peak. <clears throat> How are you doing? I'm okay, thank you. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Um, Alison, would you like to tell us, uh, give us a brief introduction? Yes, I'm Alison Chambers. Um, I'm currently, well, I'm living full time now in Gran Canaria and I'm in my early 60s. When um when did you realise that you were trans? Um, I knew there was something different, but I didn't know what when I was about seven or eight years of age, mm -hmm. and that was my very first dressing occasion when two friends over the road, which are girls, Linda and Pamela, and we dressed up. And I've known ever since that I was different and have struggled with it throughout my life, I guess. And that's mainly because growing up in the teenage years, early 20s, even my early 30s, you know, there was hardly any information about it. There was no internet. There was no help. I couldn't talk to anybody. So, yeah, I used to... I used to dress up and, you know, in private and whenever I had the opportunity. So, yeah, it was difficult in those early teens and 20s. Are you, I guess, though, it, like, goes to show, like, how amazing and how important having, like, trans visibility is. 100%. Right. I, I, from my perspective... The way that the awareness of transgender, transgender issues, some of the struggles that we face on a daily basis, for me, has become more visible in all forms of media. Um, kind of go over the last five to maybe seven years. So you now see it being debated in Parliament. You see it being debated on the television. You have the rise of um, what I would call a feminist right wing who appear to be determined to make our lives as difficult as possible. And I think that if you speak to most transgender girls or boys, I think that most of us just want to be able to live our lives that makes us happy without the fear of transphobic abuse, loss of jobs, loss of medical support, etc. You so that's what I'm no go on. You talked about like um oh sorry did I just um you talked about um like your like struggles briefly. Do you want to like elaborate on that if, if you feel comf if you feel comfortable? Of um, yes, I mean I'd like to. So I'd like to try to get a message across is that whilst you think there may be no hope and you're struggling with identity or whatever, there are support groups. There is help out there. Um, unfortunately for me, at my age, when I needed that support, help just to even talk to somebody, it was just not there. So I kind of guess is that for me at 31 years of age, I thought I just can't live my life anymore like this. I was married. I'd got two boys. 
I've got a, a, a good job. And the constant thoughts and hiding away was doing my head in. So I went to my doctor. And of course, in those days, he knew nothing about it. So I got referred to, to a hospital. I had 12 months worth of psychiatric treatment to basically cure me. And that didn't help. And then in the end, against my better judgment, they decided to give me electric shock treatment for 12 months, which I can tell you is painful and it's very uncomfortable. And, you know, it was, uh, and it didn't help. <laughs> it didn't help. I had nothing changed. Psychiatric, electric shock, nothing happened. And then some years later, I came to a crossroads in my life. My wife had walked out on me, taken my two children. And I planned everything down to the, to the nth degree. And I decided to commit suicide. And it didn't work because <laughs> I'm still here. So, and I was found by two walkers unconscious and then had to have more therapy to get myself around that. And then, and then I decided this is it. I can't continue to live this lie anymore. And I decided to come out and full time and start to go to the gender clinic. And that changed my life. And now I've been uh, full time for over five years now, continue to be on hormones, um, had breast augmentation two and a half years ago, and I'm now living my life in Gran Canaria. How amazing does it feel to be at that point? It's been a very long and a very difficult journey, and I will absolutely say that I don't think I could have done it without the support of my ex-wife. And certainly my four boys have been absolutely wonderful about it and have fully supported me all the way. And I think because they are now living in a more enlightened world where these things are discussed, then they've said, OK, that's fine. If that's what makes you happy, we're here for you and we will support you. It is quite funny at times, I've got to say, because I go shopping with them and we're going to Asda or Tesco or whatever. And sometimes they forget and they'll go, Dad. And I turn around and you get people who will look. But you know what? I've got broad enough shoulders and it doesn't bother me. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I look like or how I feel. Believe it or not, I'm still their dad. And that's important for both me and for them. Wholesome. Oh, thank Wholesomeness. you. Wholesomeness. Um, how is like living in like Grand Carina? Um, I love it. I mean, I've been on holiday here for the last eight years and I kind of guess is mm -hmm. that I fell in love with the island straight away. Um, it is, I don't know if you know, it's a very liberal island. It's got some amazing scenery. It's got amazing beaches. It's even got a mountain. Um, it is well known for hosting probably one of the largest pride events in Europe. Um, in fact, last year there was 45,000 visitors, so I'm told. And I fell in love with it. And the very first time I came to Gran Canaria, I only came for four days. And the joy of being able to kind of be myself 24-7 and wear a bikini and go clubbing and all the rest of it, and it, it did help me change my life. And when I was due to come home and I had to change back into male form, 
I just sat on the wall all by myself and I just cried my eyes out, thinking I now need to change my life. I can't live like this anymore. So that's that. Really liberating, like what's going on, like having that experience. And like, um, I guess my last question to you would be, um, what is the best thing about being trans? For me, the best thing about trans is actually being myself and able to live the life that I have denied myself for so many years. It has released so much tension, so much anxiety, so much hurt. And it is, for me, it has been the most difficult of journeys. And I keep threatening to write a book and I will write a book, and I now have in Gran Canaria every opportunity to do that. But at long last, I can be myself, and I don't have to hide myself away anymore. And if people don't like that, you know what? That's not my problem. That's your problem. 100%. I'd actually, I would definitely read that book. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, I do keep I do keep threatening to do it, so I must do it. Um, I think yeah, uh, that looks like it. It was so lovely to meet you. And um, to you, thank you so much for talking to me, and thank you for allowing me to live a little bit of my story. And I hope, in maybe some small part, that can help others. Bless up. Lovely to see you from you. Okay, take care. Bye. So, yeah, next up we have um, Fanny Aldorian, who is organising a protest in London on Saturday. For those of you listening in London, you should go to. Hello, my name is Nathan Adam. I'm part of Trans Pride Southwest. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And today we are joined by Fanny Aldorian, who pronouns he, him, and they, them. Um, for those who don't know Thaniel, uh, he actually organised the first protest, um, the first large protest in London regarding the uh, government's leaked proposal to scrap the promised uh, Gender Recognition Act uh, to reform it so that you don't have to uh, have medical uh, procedures done and you don't have to prove medical procedures done and spend a sh- a a lot of money I almost swore then a lot of money to actually get it sorted out a lot of money a lot of time work and then necessarily then go up against a bunch of people who don't know anything about uh sort of like gender and sexuality and whatsoever and and hope that they say yeah cool um and also about the uh the the supposed proposal um acts that uh Liz Truss wants to put in form regarding uh single space uh, single sex based uh, places including toilets and refuges and sort of basically exclude trans women from them. So uh, we're not actually here to talk about the protest, though we will probably talk about it a bit later. We are actually more here to talk about ASD, so autism spectrum disorder. Um, so the one thing that Daniel really likes to put in his protests is that they are fully accessible uh, whether that person has a physical disability or a mental disability, um, that they can go there and they can protest and they can stand uh, with all the other community as well and be a part of it and make that easily accessible to them. Because a lot of the time, would you agree, Daniel, that a lot of the time protests don't really sort of focus on that a lot? Yeah, they're very typically... Uh, March based which is already quite inaccessible for a lot of people Um, and even when they are static protests they often don't put a huge emphasis on accessibility. And I guess the same with with uh, I know that Bristol Pride have been trying very hard to make Bristol Pride more accessible um, but in the history Prides have not been all that greatly accessible either and it's not something that's coming up. Yeah that's definitely been an issue. Okay Um, well let's start off so from the small amount of research that I've done uh, I found actually quite a lot of terms and labels for um, for sort of autism, ASD, ASC, um, 
what are the preferred terms um, that should be used by the general public um, regarding autism and what sort of labels are commonly used that could actually be quite problematic? So I think a lot of the time, like with many things, um, it comes down to personal preference. So some people may be using older terms because of the time that they were diagnosed or the person they've been diagnosed by. And sometimes it literally just comes down to preference. Um, so ASD, autism spectrum disorder, is one that's been used for quite a while now. And a lot of people like that simply because of the emphasis on the word spectrum. Um, it makes autism seem a little bit less black and white. Um, autism spectrum condition has started to become a little bit more popular just because it takes away the word disorder. So it sounds a little bit less medical. For me personally, I find that ASC and ASD both sound kind of similarly medical. I don't think there's a massive difference between disorder and condition, but some people do genuinely prefer it. Um, for me personally, I think that just the word autistic is the easiest because it's straightforward and we know what it means generally. However, there is a lot of overlap between other neurodiverse um, conditions. So a lot of people will not experience just symptoms of autism. They may also have symptoms of dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, ADD, um, even Tourette's has come under it before as well. Um, some types of epilepsy as well even have crossover. So for that reason a lot of people also just prefer neurodiverse it means you don't have to go into details specifically about what you've been diagnosed with and it gives a more general idea i would say that neurodiverse is kind of like the word queer so it's more of an umbrella term that covers a lot of things and also much like with queer people if you're not sure just ask one yeah. person may prefer another term it's like pronouns or sexuality just ask what they prefer to use um, I would say the one term to avoid using, but some people are still comfortable with it, um, would be Asperger's, which is supposed to be a very specific kind of autism. However, it has links to Hans Asperger. The guy who came up with it was a Nazi eugenicist. Ah, okay. <laughs> so yeah, it's not a great word to use. So if you can avoid it, I would, but some people have been diagnosed with it still um, are kind of trying to take it back because that's a word they're used to. But yeah, I would generally say safe bet autism or just ask. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. Um, so do you believe people on the spectrum, people with autism or um, even neurodiversity, um, do you think they're not taken seriously or discriminated against when it comes to expressing their gender identity? It can certainly be the case. Um, there's been a lot of information recently in the news about something we've known for a while, which is that a high percentage of um, trans patients in gender clinics are autistic or on some kind of neurodiverse spectrum um, and some people are sort of wondering why that is. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to you're not more likely to be autistic if you're trans or vice versa, it's just that autistic people tend to be more likely to embrace who they are without caring about what society feels. Autistic people very often just see something about themselves and go, okay, cool, so what do I do now to make that happen? Rather than, oh no, what will people think of me? And that sometimes can cause issues with gender clinics. Um, I have a friend uh, from Sweden who I remember back when he was being um, referred to his gender clinic, they were literally told that you can't be both. If you're autistic, that means you must be lying about being transgender and you're just confused because you're autistic. Yeah. I've definitely heard less tales of that in the UK, thankfully, but I think it can be quite um, a hurdle, especially for younger people who are receiving treatment for their autism because people will want to focus on one condition and not the other. So that can cause uh, barriers when trying to get gender care. Right. This, yeah, it's usually a lot of these sort of things do come hand in hand. And I, I've known personally that there's quite a few, quite a few trans people that I know and non-binary people as well who are, who do have autism and um, have really struggled sort of getting help that they need or being able to express it anyway. Um, uh, do you believe that being on the spectrum makes it more difficult to get medical care for transitioning, um, whether that be just uh, socially or medically um, um, and vice versa? Do you believe that people who are transitioning then find it difficult to get help with neurodiversity? It can certainly be the case. Um, as I say, one of the benefits, having autism can kind of have 
one big pro and one big con. On one side, you're very good at accepting things about yourself and can be more direct about asking for help. But on the other hand, you may have social issues, which mean that you're more inclined to put on a mask and not ask for help. Yeah. So it can vary depending on the situation. It can sometimes be difficult to get help, and especially for adults, whether it's gender care or neurodiversity care. Um, there's also a lot of issues with uh, trans men who have been socialized female because a lot of women are not diagnosed with autism and therefore someone who may be AFAB will not be taken as seriously for the same reasons though, even though they don't identify as female, it will still be seen as, well, you were born with a vagina, therefore you cannot have autism, which is a very weird outdated thing that still happens yeah. to a lot of people. Very, very strange. I mean, a lot of a lot of people already have very sort of strange ideas about um, about autism and what 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 creates it, um, and also the same with anyone who identifies as transgender. Again, sort of like, what is this weird thing? And and sort of the, one of the questions that I have is that there's obviously sort of like a lot of wild conspiracies, um, uh, much like how people have towards people who are transgender and non-binary. Uh, that someone catches autism and how to cure it, um, which of course autism doesn't need curing. It's just a, it's just a different way of thinking. Um, and uh, what, what have you heard any sort of really crazy conspiracies about autism? Um, obviously, we know quite a lot about anti-vaxxers who think that uh, vaccinations cause autism. Um, what, have you heard anything, and also about being transgender as well, have you heard any sort of crazy conspiracies about that? Well, in terms of being trans and autistic, there's kind of the weird thing going around at the moment because of people like JK Rowling, which is this idea that autistic kids are being trans as a way of taking advantage of their autism which is very strange, and to my knowledge, it's certainly never happened. Um, there's a lot of big myths around autism. One of the common ones is the idea that autistic people don't have empathy. Mm. They just don't experience it, which is also like a common description of a psychopath as well. So putting those two together isn't especially great. And a lot of people do kind of consider it one in the same, that autistic people are people who don't have feelings and they're just logical and kind of straightforward, which definitely isn't true i think some people have difficulty with socialization and reading other people and tone and that's interpreted as a lack of empathy or they struggle to communicate and that's determined as um, a lack of empathy which isn't the case at all a lot of autistic people have too much empathy and it can become quite overstimulating mm. um another common one uh is oh gosh i had it on my brain and i've just lost it mm. instead i'll go to one that's absolutely horrific um one of the worst, most bizarre ideas I've heard about autism is the idea that all autistic people have the brains of children. Mm. And there was a thing going around on Facebook a while ago, I think it was last year, suggesting that autistic people cannot have adult relationships and they absolutely cannot have sex. Yeah. Because to have sex with an autistic person is basically sexual abuse. They don't have the ability to consent. Which I had a discussion with my boyfriend at the time and he didn't agree <laughs> <laughs> neither did i it was very strange there's a lot of weird ideas that kind of infantilize um, autistic people and think of them as children that reminds me of the other one which is the idea of the whole rain man thing that every mm. autistic person has some special magical ability which i wish was the case because i would love to have one but i can't draw buildings from memory or play the piano without and knowing how to read music so unfortunately that one's mostly a myth as well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so finally sort of obviously we've only got sort of like a short amount of time we have to sort of draw this to an end um and relating closely to the protest as well which we would also like to mention is happening on the the fifth so this sunday um obviously not this sunday that saturday. we're recording oh saturday sorry <laughs> so obviously not this saturday that we're recording this but the saturday when this video goes out live uh, so the fifth um in uh it's parliament square in parliament Central square yeah. um starting at what time at 1 p.m 1 p.m fantastic um so what can we do as the transgender community and as the lgbt community as a whole what can we do to make sure members who do have ASD or are neurodiverse, um, what can we do as a community to make these members more welcome and more included in the community? 
I would say there are three main things. So the first one is just consider accessibility. If you're putting on any kind of event, group or anything like that, just try and think about accessibility. It won't just benefit neurodiverse people, but disabled people in general. You won't always be able to account for everything and that's fine, but don't default to able-bodied and neurotypical people. It'll benefit everyone. And you'll often find that by being accessible, you benefit more people than you think about as well. Um, the second one is just to listen to autistic people. Don't assume you, that you know what they need or what will benefit them in the long run. Just give them a chance to actually speak for themselves because, as I mentioned, they're not children. Um, we can speak about all sorts of things, so just have a conversation. Most autistic people are very happy to talk about it. Some people never stop talking about it, again, like me. <laughs> <laughs> and the third thing, when I get my brain back in gear, was something I've immediately forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> there was a third thing. <sighs> One fun thing about autism and neurodiversity is that you get brain fog and brain block and you plan something in your head and then it immediately goes. Oh, no. <laughs> we'll just pretend it was two things and they're, they're both really good and really important. Yeah. And if you could just move <laughs> your mouth a little bit and then when you remember, we can just splice it back on and then no one will know. <laughs> <laughs> dubs, not dubs, so, so. <laughs> uh, well on that note thank you daniel for for joining us um and good luck with the protest on saturday um again if you want to join in that protest it's the 5th of september the saturday uh starts at 1 p.m you have an amazing array of speakers actually coming along so it should be a really good day and i and i hope that i for personally and for the community that the government just bloody well listen <laughs> yeah hopefully we won't have to have another one for a long time i think as well yeah awesome thank you daniel thank you um so next up we have um, um travis alabanza who is a um performer and activist and yeah hello there <laughs> hi magic um do you want to like introduce yourself just in case um, there are some people who aren't aware of who you are? Sure, why not? Yes, my name is Travis Alabanza. Um, before many things, I'm actually a Bristolian born and bred. And uh, amongst many other things, I'm also an artist, a theatre maker and a writer. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I, we've already met, but my name is Sean. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I guess I just wanted to start by asking, like, um, what does euphoria mean to you? And actually, what does passing mean to you? Wow. Um, two quite big questions. I guess um, euphoria in the sense of gender, which I guess is where we are in transness. Well, euphoria, you know, just means joy, a feeling of ecstaticness, elatedness. I think for me, euphoria was like an important word to start talking about because often so often my personal experience of being trans, but also the narrative was one of always talking about my dysphoria, you know, always talking about the ways in which I wasn't meeting what I wanted or what I thought I wanted or what I was. So that my relationship to myself and my body and my transness was always in direct relation to the things that I was not being able to do or could not be. Always like a less than, you know? I don't know if, if, if that's a similar feeling, but like dysphoria always makes me feel like I'm just a bit behind where I should be. Whereas euphoria feels like an arrival. Euphoria feels like that moment, it might be for a second, it might be for a day, it might be for an hour, where you feel at arrival for where you're meant to be. I don't know if that makes sense, but like that's how I feel euphoria feels. Um, it feels like I'm not playing catch up. It feels like a moment where I'm like, Such a yeah. I love that. Yeah. So I guess that's, yeah, what euphoria. Obviously, it's also the show on Netflix, isn't it? But um, I haven't watched <laughs> it. <laughs> um, actually, I, like I've been thinking quite a lot about this, and it's kind of like, do you think. Um, you mentioned that there exists a kind of like narrative that like I guess trans people are usually expected to conform to with like you know dysphoria and I guess you know do you think there's kind of like um 
oh, how do I explain it? A kind of um, expectation that, like, I guess, for being trans, or actually, like, being, like, part of, like, other marginalised identities as well, or actually, I guess, kind of, like, supposed to hate ourselves to a degree for not um, not conforming to a cis-normative uh, standard or a white, or a... Um, your normative standard, etc. Yeah, I do. I, and, you know, obviously it's also personal. I think what's so hard about being trans and being any kind of person that needs to have to come out or is not the norm is that so often we forget how deeply personal these things are for us because we're so used to having to confess in order to get respect. We have to go, here, was, here I am, here I am, here I am. Please give me basic human rights. And so I think we are getting... Mm we're so used to having to confess about our dysphoria that we forget how deeply personal and unique each person's experience is. I would say one thing that, um, although obviously dysphoria is a huge part of so many trans people's lives and my own life, is that for me, I've only just recently started speaking about it because for so long I was like, but it doesn't need to be part of my life. And also it doesn't need to be part of their understanding of me that actually I think what sometimes happens in conversations around dysphoria is that so often the conversation becomes just about our personal journey, like we were born like this and we felt like this and we needed to change to feel like this, that it leaves out a huge other factor which is you, i.e. cis normative culture, cis people, cis violence, have made it impossible for me to live in this state. And so often we disconnect the political from dysphoria we forget that actually dysphoria is completely linked to harassment. Dysphoria is completely linked to uh, systems of gendering on passports or legal markers. Dysphoria is completely linked to turf ideology. All these things fuel how we feel about our internal self. And so for me, I guess what I'm less interested in is that how the trans conversation has made dysphoria this deeply um, individual thing that only is like, only we can solve. It's almost our job as trans people to solve our dysphoria, i.e. to crowdfund ourselves, i.e. to talk about it and figure out ourselves. Whereas actually the fact that we are crowdfunding tells us something about the welfare state. It tells us something about the lack of medical provisions for trans people. It tells us about all these other things that for me are far more vital in a conversation for cis people to see, rather than them just constantly seeing, we're born in the wrong body and now we feel like this. I don't want them to know about that. That's for me and my girls to talk about. You know, I don't, I don't want them to know all of those details about that because that's none of their business. You know, what I want them to think about is what society is being created where no matter what state a trans person is in, they are safe, loved, and have the things they need to feel themselves, you know? Thank you. That was such a beautiful answer. Thanks, girl. <laughs> um, so I guess kind of like that relates to passing, like um, what does passing mean to you? Like, do you think that it has any sort of like innate connections with like um, various kinds of like, you know, structural injustices like misogyny, racism, etc.? Girl, you're coming in heavy today, straight up the bat. Oh. <laughs> I, love I love it. And you're like chilling from your bedroom and just being wherever you are, being like coming in like this. I'm like, damn, the Zoom can't take it. You know, for me about passing, <laughs> and I say this to, you know, another black person, like passing to what? Because racialized people know that we will never pass, like, you know, cis or trans, mm -hmm. a racialized person will never pass in society. So I feel like obviously I know when people say passing, they're meaning a specific conversation around transness and they're meaning a specific conversation around how gender non-conforming you are or how not gender non-conforming you are. And there is a definite valid conversation to be had around the proximities to gender non-conformity equals a proximity to violence. That the more gender non-conforming you are, the more violence you will receive in certain ways. I wholeheartedly believe that. However, what I think is missing in the conversation around passing is that people have this binary of you're passing and you're not passing, whereas it's completely situational. Passing to what and passing to what scenario? We've seen, unfortunately, that passing does not protect Black trans women from murder. Passing does not protect Black trans women from disproportionate amounts of violence. All these things are so conditional. 
because passing suggests a kind of tightrope, I feel, that we are almost taught to aim towards and believe that when we tread upon it, one wrong move and we are suddenly not passing and suddenly we experience this violence or we can speak and they'll clock us in our voice or um, as soon as they find out we're trans anyway, disclosure means violence. I'm less interested in like internally talking about passing, not passing. And I guess what I'm more fascinated by is how do we create a world where it does not matter? You do not need to be passing to matter. You do not need to be passing to be safe. That when we are transitioning, we are transitioning for our desire and our want, but we are not transitioning because we need safety. Whereas so often, I think that for me personally, so many of my transition choices I'm making this year are deeply linked to a desire for safety or more safety or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's fucked. Can I swear on here? I don't know. But if I can, that's fucked, you know? Um, and, you know, I think as black people, whether you're cis or trans, gender is always going to say we are failing. Gender is about failure, right? And throughout history, black people of all genders have been told that they are failing at being man or woman, whether they are cis or trans. And so we can't pass. The, our black cis women aren't passing. Our black trans women aren't passing. There is no passing under white supremacy when you're black. So I think the conversation on passing is so centralized on a white trans idea of transitioning that it completely misses out that black people will never pass in a white society, period. Very true. Girl, you, got um, you got me on the preacher box today, girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I do, I guess. Um, yeah, so you said that you're a performer. Um, what are you working on right now? Um, I'm working Bit on... Of a I'm working on uh, waiting for all the shows to be able to reopen. Um, you know, I was mid... Um, I was mid international tour. I was in Brazil, actually, whilst lockdown was... Uh, called with burgers and so we were on international tour and so I hopefully I'll finish that I'm also writing a lot of shows for, for other people at the moment which is really exciting obviously all of these are pending on large gatherings being allowed to happen again so right now I'm working on rest <laughs> I'm working on uh, um, myself and things like that I'm just waiting for theatre and all these projects I had in the like you know had in the mix to be allowed to exist again safely, I guess. I'm working on getting to know Bristol again. It's changed, girl. It's changed. Right. Yeah. Self-care is important, especially when you're trans. So true, you know? And I think having time to figure out what my, check in with my gender again, that's like outside of other people, you know? I think so often again, we're so used to constantly disclosing so much of ourselves that I haven't had time to really sit with myself and be like, who am I when the noise isn't there? What do I need? What do I want? Find the right place for laser in the, laser hair in the city, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, so I kind of like had one more question. Uh -huh. um, it's something that I've been thinking um, about quite a lot recently. Um, and I guess it can relate back to like what you said about how um, like, you know, various injustices have power to control people's bodies. Um, and I guess kind of like understanding that, I, I just want to ask like, to you, what is the best thing about being trans? Ah, oh, what a gorgeous question. I want to know your answer after, okay? The mic is Yeah, up. sure. Um, you know, I think, for me, I meet people of older ages that are not trans, that are maybe straight, and they're reckoning with learning that they're allowed to say no, and learning that they are allowed to carve their own rules for themselves. And it will be like 40, 50 year old men in my family finally learning that they can decide to do something for themselves. And I think what's so beautiful about transness, trans people, despite all the amounts of violence, despite all the amounts of injustices around us we are choosing to carve our own rules for our own bodies and our own selves we're saying that actually the thing that we were given 
doesn't work for us and we are deciding to be autonomous in the midst of so much violence. For me, that is so beautiful because when I struggle, when I feel like there is times when I'm finding it too hard or when my life comes up with another challenge that maybe has nothing to do with being trans, I remember that I did the most powerful decision for myself to say, fuck you, I'm not this, I'm actually this. And I'm like, how bad ass is that? Like, I don't know, like, and we're still doing it. And like, we're still here and we would still, I mean, for me, that feels, I just love it. it. It makes me so excited and happy for us because it's, it's, it's a remarkable, I always have the image of like, I don't know that I'm not very good at plants, but apparently there's like plants that can survive windstorms and rain and like fires and they'll still be there in the seeds. And I often think that about trans mm -hmm. is that like there are fires, there are winds, there is de-archiving, all these things. And then as trans people are like still here growing. Beautiful. What about you? Love that. Um, I'd actually say that like um, the experiences that, you know, um, how do I phrase this? like from having like a particular standpoint um and having like you know certain experiences i'd say that it's like put me in like a reasonable position to like i guess understand how like various sort of like injustices sort of like intersect um it's like and actually having like i guess such a like <laughs> weird like understanding like of gender um like in particular like you know being a trans person of color and i guess really i don't know being able to um form such a view on how race like shapes gender um i don't know if i'm like making sense but i guess like what i'm saying is like i don't know the like, for lack of a better term, like epistemic privilege. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I guess that's what I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, it gives you a position to be able to see other things because you can see it how it's crossing here with you. Right. Um, and I guess, I don't know, it kind of puts me in a place where I'm kind of like um, quite determined to sort of like challenge what um injustices that like i guess people who may be in not necessarily like um similar positions but like similar positions because of course like you know we understand like how um how difficult at times our lives may be but obviously for some people who don't have the same privileges that we do it's like mm. it kind of puts everything into perspective does that sort of like make sense absolutely 100 i think being trans builds a natural solidarity across so many different people and places you're so right i love that love that right um it looks like we've come to the end of the interview sadly oh, but nice to see you <laughs> So good to see you too. Um, I do she like at some point love to like you know discuss this stuff like properly, properly. We should, um, we absolutely should. Whether that's in pi private or public, we'll go for a coffee or not. Um, I can't wait. We got we gotta have a longer conversation in this. That'd be so groovy. Um, right. Um, are there any like final words that you'd like to say? No, I think that's good. Just happy, happy Southwest Trans Pride. I hope everyone is enjoying the virtual celebrations of it. And uh, I'm going to go get a cider in honour. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> <really. laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, that's that. That's that. All right. Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for um, like listening to like our amazing speakers. Um, but yeah, bless up, big up everyone.